So in looking for a new project uh, to keep me occupied during lockdown, I came across some rather nice drawings of the Princeton of Chapelle in, Chappe in Chapelle's search for speed under sail. This two-masted schooner was a very fast privateer and took several prizes in the English Channel. At the time, she could outrun all our Navy's vessels. Eventually, she was captured, surveyed, and her lines taken off. The Navy considered using them to build a similar vessel, but the report on air construction said she was too lightly built for our Navy. Consequently, there was no further action. At 110 feet, 8 inches overall length, my calculations showed that with my current space limitations, I could build to 1 60th scale to give a hull length of approximately 22 inches. With bowsprit and main boom overhangs, it would come out at 34 and a half inches. Small for a working model, but large enough to house miniature radio equipment. At the size, I accepted that I would not have square sails to the foremast as I have no way of bracing them. Why, you might ask, am I showing a picture of a humble sloop? That's only 10 inches long. It was an experiment in building a hull from a block of polystyrene foam covered with epoxy resin fiberglass. The long cargo hatch helped follow, hollowing out and a large enough cutout was created for radio control on rudder only. Final sailing trim was achieved by inserting a 50p coin behind the server, not visible in this shot. Incredibly, this little model sails very well, so I was encouraged to apply the proven technique to building the Prince de Neuchâtel, slightly larger, but still a small model. Into a basic plug of polystyrene, a slot is cut for keel, stem and stern post, with stations marked for hull shaping. I used Araldite 5 mm epoxy to finish, but PVA would also have done the job. From experience, the cheaper epoxy resins eat the foam, as do most other adhesives, including Sino. The plug is intentionally too deep, and a mark is made for the shear. Here the hull is beginning to take shape, sanding to the shear line, and it has a first coat of epoxy fiberglass resin. I have not used any cloth on such a small hull. I like to get radio equipment installed early, and here I've cut a large enough space to house a smaller than standard servo, battery, and receiver. This is a much larger space than provided by the deck apertures and hatch cutouts, which are shown on the ply under deck in the background. I had to make sure I could remove everything if needed to before sealing. The deck covers the larger cutout, leaving access as shown, and you can just see the rudder servo. The switch is mounted in the small hatch cutout, mounted above the battery. This hatch also gives access to the charging lead. The slide shows the underdeck in position with a cutout for the forward hatch, which will ultimately give access to the keel fixing, as will be shown later. The exterior of the hull has been given a second coat of epoxy resin, but sanding the underdeck under deck to shape removed some of it and it had to be reapplied. You can just see that on the top of the picture. I've used a variety of resins from Bucks Laminates and also Easy Laminates. Both have comprehensive websites. In this shot, gunnels have been fitted by gluing to the underdeck. The whale planks match the join and some filling and finishing of the hull has been done. This is a cleaned up version of the stern with the battery charging lead escaping from the small hatch. Construction has moved on. The deck has been planked. I used 3 inch wide by 132 thick balsa strips with inked edges. These are a little wide perhaps as this equates to approximately 10 inches full size, but they do have some very large trees in America. Rather than cutouts, I decided to make gun ports from thin plastic card. I was a long time working on their position, which is critical. 
and some come between the spread of the chain plates. It didn't help that I had incorrectly joined the chapelle drawings, missing out one of the gun ports. 11 into 10 does not work. Chain plates are thin brass strips bound to dead eyes with fine copper wire. The photo shows they are not yet fixed, as I like to run a cord from the mast to mark their low points to get them at the correct angle. The bowsprit is made up of three parts and is half as long as the entire hull. It carries much rigging, which I've had to simplify for practicality. I did a lot of research into a paint job for the hull. I had not appreciated what a popular modelling subject it is, and indeed there are several kits available. There are quite a few pictures of finished models on the internet, but I cannot find two that are exactly alike. Each modeler has interpreted the colour scheme differently. Perhaps there is not a definitive available, or at least none that I can find. As such, I created my own scheme with some reference to common features in other models. A view of the foredeck with wooden mast rings held out of the way. They were wound using thin veneer and white glue and had to be in position before fixing the masts. Each mast, mast is raked towards the stern, but at different angles. I think it was at this point that I decided the bare looking deck would be better with some armament. The trucks for the gun carriages were made from 2.5 millimeter diameter ramming dowel, a tricky process as many split before completion. I had more success drilling the dowel first and then slicing off the trucks. I turned up carronade barrels on the Unimat lathe, again using ramming dowel. I am no accomplished wood turner and each barrel is very slightly different but not immediately apparent at such a small scale. They are only 17 millimetres long. I mean 18 guns in all, which means 72 trucks. My patience was sorely tested. The ship's boat is quite a prominent feature and could not be omitted. It was carved from solid balsa, using the plan as a template, with stem, keel and stern post added. It is mounted over the forward hatch, to which I need access, so whilst it appears to be standing in a cradle, it is actually glued to the hatch and is removed as a unit. When removed, it allows access to the single rod keel fixing, which is held in position by a removable 1 16th split pin. The sides of the fin engage with the projecting keel to keep it in position fore and aft. I first tried out this fixing on my barge and it proved satisfactory. The keel is made up of thin lead strips and it looks quite odd. I had the strips much longer prior to the initial launch and before any sailing was attempted, the strips were cut back as required to get the sit and fore and aft trim. This is critical in such a small model and is the only way I could achieve trim as there is no access to the hull. The sails are made from boiled down architect's tracing linen. They are very lightweight and I decided rather than sew on bolt ropes, I would stick them using PVA, something I haven't tried before. It was okay, but when I tried to dye sails with tea, it was a failure. It did not take in the glued areas. Consequently, the sails are whiter than I would like. The illustration is of the four gaff mainsail and it has a wider seam at the foot into which I have inserted a thin brass rod. It is loose footed and this will help it to set. This partial deck shot shows it in position and it does look somewhat stiff until it catches the wind. It also shows the armament which has enhanced the bare look of the deck. As an aside, I've experimented with dyeing cotton with very thin artist's acrylic paint. Raw sienna with some blackish water mixed and applied to the cloth before sewing has worked well on the pond model I've recently finished. Hopefully this will avoid the fade effect time has on tea stains. So we now have maiden voyage shots taken on a day with very little wind. The model responded well to the conditions due to an increased rudder, and I was surprised how manageable it is in the light airs. There were one or two puffs, 
and the model showed it was capable of sailing very fast and was well balanced. The shot shows that although I had preset the sails to what I thought was an optimum angle, some further adjustment to the head sails is required, and particularly to the flying jib. Hopefully, I will be able to do some fine tuning this year at the pond. All in all, I was quite happy with the results, but I was not keen on the large space between the masts. So I decided to make the middle stay sail to give a more balanced overall appearance. My final slide is the model in its finished form, showing the very large sail area in relation to the hull. I am reassured that even if it is knocked down in a large gust, the polystyrene will keep it afloat, and in fact, it cannot sink. And that's it.